The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Friday, June 13th, 2014. Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship Questions and Answers Time, where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker, Chris McCann. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Friday night question and answer program. Tonight we're going to take a look at the Bible with any questions or comments that anyone may have. And each person is invited to share whatever may be on your mind by contacting us in one of the ways we just mentioned. And we'll be happy to take your call. And I'll try to respond as much as possible by going to the Bible as the Bible is God's Word. But at this time, uh, since we have such a short time together, we're going to go right to the first caller. Welcome to our question and answer program this evening. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, good evening, Chris. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. It was a wonderful study tonight, and I just wondered if I had a, a, an announcement to make and also a, a Bible verse to look at. And yes, go ahead. Announcement. The announcement is um, everyone listening is invited to attend the eBible Fellowships California two-day in the Word in Sacramento, California conference with guest speakers Chris McCann and Robert Daniels, and it'll go from 9 to 3 on both Saturday and Sunday, August the 9th and 10th, 2014 in Sacramento. And um, the nearest airport to that is, if you're flying in, is Sacramento International Airport instead of having to fly into San Francisco or Oakland. And also there's a number of hotels that we can send to you, a list of them, if you would like, at ebiblefellowship at juno.com. And there's also a potluck um, lunch to be served on both days, and we would like to know if you would be able to bring a covered dish of some sort, and Margaret Pease is in charge of that. So if you, would, if you would, are interested in coming, we would love you to, to join us and to know if you're going to come. So if you could just email at that at ebiblefellowship at juno.com. That's the announcement. And then the Bible verse is in Zechariah. It's in chapter 14, verse 14. Zechariah 14. To compare it with the Second Chronicles twenty verse twenty five. Okay. Zechariah fourteen fourteen says, And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And compare to Second Chronicles twenty twenty five. Twenty five, yeah. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And there were three, and they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. Yeah, I guess my question about this is, um, it's similar, but it's not exact um, language in the verses. But it was the idea that uh, chapter 14 is happening during the Day of Judgment. And I just wondered what you thought about that for Zechariah. Um, if, if these are referring to the same time period. Well, Zechariah 14 discusses the judgment on the church and the judgment on the world. Uh, earlier in Zechariah 14... It says um, in verse 2, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken. So there's the judgment that begins at the house of God. The nations are the Gentiles, and uh, just as Revelation 11 says, the Gentiles um, trod down the um, court outside of the temple. And, and so that's um, what that's referring to. And a little later, God speaks of Christ coming with ten thousands of his saints. So it it is a chapter focused 
on just as the, the disciples asked Jesus, what shall be the sign of the coming in the end of the world? And then Christ spoke of the great tribulation and the end. And, and so Zechariah 14 deals with that too. And when it says in verse 14, and Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's in view there. Uh, we know it's the, the time of the end. Um, is Judah fighting at Jerusalem a reference to the, the uh, Great Tribulation? Um, uh, I'm not sure. So I, I'm, I don't think I can really say exactly what that's referring to. In Second Chronicles 20, with um, Jehoshaphat and the army of Judah going forth to battle against uh, enemy forces, that that um, there were many of them, but but Judah also had a great army, and yet they didn't fight in the battle. Um, God is the one who fought for them in arranging for their enemies to fight themselves and destroy themselves, and then as a result. Of, um, of, of God winning the victory, Judah, led by Jehoshaphat, uh, come upon the spoils. They, they gather the gold and silver and precious jewels, and, and that would point to the, um, the, the spoils of victory that come at the end of time when God's people, led by the Lord Jesus Christ, are... Uh, finally, the recipients of all of the riches of this world, we we will receive the new heaven and new earth. We will receive an eternal inheritance, and the people of this world will be dead. So it points to that gold and silver does identify also with believers, and therefore spiritual wealth. But I, I'm I'm not exactly sure how again how to understand Zechariah verse. Okay, well, thank you very much, and um, you have a great evening. All right, well, thank you for calling and for sharing the announcement as well as uh, those scriptures, and let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, Thank you. Um, I've been reviewing your messages regarding the sovereignty of God, and... um, I have a question and two Bible verses that I'd like to refer to, and my uh, question surrounds the fact that, well, first of all, you were very clear about uh, the choice being God's alone. Um, However, if man is saved by God's choice, as in Jacob and in Esau, for example, uh, then it seems to me uh, that it not correct to say that we are not deserving of salvation. I mean, we're all sinners, and God chooses who he will choose out of the population of sinners. So therefore, as salvation has nothing to do with our deserving, but rather entirely on God's choice only, um, it bothers me to hear uh, the word deserving um, connected with salvation. And I looked the word up in Strong's Concordance and only found two references in uh, Ezra 9.13 and in Job 11.6. And in each of those references, uh, the word is used, um, uh, we are punished less than our iniquities deserve, and God exacts less than our iniquities deserve. So therefore, the word deserve is, to me, seems to be linked with God's mercy and um, not with whether or not he chooses us for salvation. Well, let me me just see if I um, understand your your, uh, comment or your question. Um, are, Are you saying that that as, when you were listening to the uh, study, the sovereignty of God, that that you heard that um, I I said that that no, no, someone no. deserved. No, no, no. I'm just saying that I often hear people say 
that I'm not deserving of my salvation or we don't or people say you, we don't deserve to be saved that sort of thing but it was uh, very clear I'm just saying that's in general I hear the word deserving linked with salvation I've heard that link for for quite a number of years now however your to me your messages on the sovereignty of God were very clear uh, that you know it was not deserve deserving had nothing to do with our salvation that God it's entirely God's choice he just there's the population of sinners and he decides this is my choice this one is my choice and this one is my choice so we there's nothing in us that would indicate whether we were deserving or not deserving of salvation on the other hand you know it just said i hear the word deserving so oh, often well, used and i think it's used incorrectly when when it's linked with salvation oh well i, I uh, you know we we can find um legitimate fault with a great deal of what the church is or, or um, Christianity teaches today. Um, but if, if someone's saying that we're saved and we don't deserve it, um, I don't think there's any fault with that statement. Now, there can be a fault if they're saying we're saved, we don't deserve it, and, and we've done nothing to earn it, and, and yet they go on to talk about well, you have to accept Christ, or you have to do this, or you have to do that, because then they're contradicting themselves. Uh, but if someone is making the statement, you know, that uh, we're saved or I'm saved, and I don't deserve it, that's a true statement as far as um, based on merit or based on work. And, and really, that's what God has in view. And uh, what I would have in view, if I would say something like that, in Romans 9, um, we, we read in verse 11, For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. And then it, it goes on a couple of verses saying, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And, and as far as the Bible's concerned, or, or the idea of deserving, if anyone had done good works, if anyone had done good, which is obeying God, and, and it was a result of that, that God chose Jacob. Because if God had said, well, Jacob kept my word and did good, and therefore I love Jacob. Esau had not kept my word and done evil, therefore um, I hate Esau. Well, then we would get the idea, all right, uh, Jacob deserved it more than Esau. But God makes a point of saying, no, before they were born, and before either one of them did anything good or anything bad, I made choice. And and so the salvation that's bestowed on Jacob is completely by the sovereign grace of God by election. And that has nothing to do with uh, anyone deserving it because of good works or earning it because of good works or um, or anything like that. God made a decision. I think if we I, I I know what you're saying, but I think if we use that kind of language in relationship or in, in reference to salvation, it, it could cause possible confusion. And we we want to stay away from that word deserve or earn or uh, or anything like that and, and no. just make yeah. sure that God gets all the credit and glory. Yes, no, I totally agree with that, and uh, that that's basically my point, that it bothers me when I do hear uh, the word deserve linked with salvation, because when you think of it then um, as totally God's choice, then it becomes such a great gift, 
such a great gift that it's just there are no words to describe it. But deserving doesn't even touch, doesn't even uh, uh, to me it should not never be linked with the word salvation. And I didn't, I'm not saying you have linked it. I'm just saying I've heard it so often that people say I'm so undeserving, you know, of this of my salvation. Da 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 da. But actually. It's um, if a person knows they're uh, saved, then um, it's a very humbling thing. It's, you know, it's, it's almost like unfathomable that God chose you out of so many billions of people to be one of his elect. And I, I just wanted to point out that just my own, like, looking into this, you know, how deserving is, is linked with the fact that we don't get the punishment that we should for the offenses that we've committed as outlined in Ezra 9.13 and Job mm-hmm. 11.6. Well, and, oh, uh, okay. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. And and there is sort of um, a slight implication when someone says that I'm so undeserving, they, there is a slight implication that maybe someone else is more deserving. And yes. Yes. and that 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 could uh, I can see uh, that's a problem. Um, and but I think most people, well, no, I can't speak for most people, but I think some people, um, they're they're just trying to um, somehow verbalize or or somehow uh, let it be known that that they have done nothing. They've done nothing, and and so they. They say that um, they're completely undeserving and and so forth. Uh, uh, I, I think the uh, idea is correct when people are talking along those lines, but but the prob the real problem is when people say one thing, but then they believe another or do another. I'm so undeserving and and uh, I I don't deserve God's grace or salvation. Why, oh, why would he save me? Well, well, uh, you think he saved you because you accepted him and, and forcibly took that salvation to yourself. Uh, and so that does not go hand in hand with, with the idea of being um, uh, just a, an undeserved uh, recipient of the grace of God. But thank yeah. you. Mm-hmm. Thank, thank you, you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Um, good evening, Chris. How are you tonight? I'm doing well. Thank you. Um, by the way, deserving does come from serving. And, and like you, we are all servants of uh, God. And like you said, if it comes with great humility, um, I agree with you, um, I don't think there's anything wrong of expressing our humility mm-hmm. and to God. Uh, anyway, um, uh, the, um, can, can you please read Zechariah chapter 5, uh, verses um, 3 and 4, please? Zechariah 5, in verse 1. Then I turned okay. and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it, and every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith Jehovah of hosts, and shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Um, could you please explain the um, role of the scroll, uh, which I believe perhaps um, brings judgment, and why God uses uh, only these two, uh, re- he refers to only the breaking of these two commandments, of the two commandments, the stealing well, and the uh, swearing. the form. flying roll uh, is a figure of the Word of God, and the um, 
uh, the uh, roll goes forth and and it says, this is the curse that goeth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth is cut off on this side, and everyone that sweareth is cut off on that side. So it, it's it's written on one side, and it's written on the other side. It's two-sided, just like the sword, which represents the word of God as a two-edged sword. And, and God only needed to mention two sins. Um, the sins are are just representative of sinners um, that are being cut off as a result of the Word of God, the Bible. And then um, it, it goes into the house of the thief. And uh, remember the church it, by Christ is called a den of thieves. And, and so the house of the thief uh, is the church, especially as it comes um, under the rule of the man of sin, Satan, at the time of the end, then thief singular applies because the the house of God has become the house of the thief, and uh, and uh, the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. So they say they're Christian, and and yet they're not. And it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. It's the, the word of God, the Bible, that has judged the church and destroyed the church. It has consumed the church spiritually so that the people of God know, well, uh, that's one place I would never want to go into have anything to do with ever again because satan was there and god gave the church over to him it became a house of of the thief and um and it came under the wrath of god and god destroyed it there's just no blessing of any kind within its walls and that's all been accomplished by the opening up of the scriptures and yeah. the word of God has destroyed the church. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. That's very clear. Thank you. Good night. You're welcome. Thank you for calling and bring up those verses. And let's go to our next caller. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Could you please comment on Philippians 1, verse 6? Philippians 1, verse 6. In verse 5, it says, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And, well, this is... uh, an encouraging verse that God has has given us that we can know if God has begun a good work in us and how would he begin that good work? Well, he would begin the work by giving us his Holy Spirit, by giving us uh, a new born again soul. And remember that that Holy Spirit is the earnest uh, or salvation is the earnest of the spirit. It's a down payment on God's whole salvation program, and and God will complete His salvation when He gives us a new resurrected body, and then He provides a new heaven and new earth, and we have eternal life to live forever. Then God's salvation is complete. But at this point in this world. He has only saved the soul of his people, and they are given the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit witnesses to their spirit. So they begin to know, to realize there has been a change in me. God has saved me and made me a new creature, a new person, and the longer the Holy Spirit is in them, uh, the, the more they come to know this and they uh, begin to develop by God's Spirit assurance of salvation, 
And so they realize God has done this part. He has done the beginning work in me and in, in saving my soul. And the Bible, though, talks about a lot of other things that God says he will also perform. And therefore, this gives me great confidence and encouragement. Once I know, and I can only know this by, again, the Holy Spirit testifying to my spirit, but I know that God has done this work in me. And, and therefore, confidence begins to develop. The, the world doesn't have this confidence. The, the, any unsaved person does not truly have this confidence. It's only the, the one that has been saved that can see it and understand it and realize it and, and uh, long for the completion of it. And so we, we have that hope. And that's why being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And now we're in the day of the Lord, the day of Jesus Christ, judgment day, but it's not finished as yet. It's not completed as yet. It's in the day of Jesus Christ, uh, which, if we're correct, would be October 7th in 2015, the 10,000th day of overall judgment. It's That's the judgment day, the 1600 days, and the 1600th day, the last day, is in the day of Jesus Christ when God completes everything. And um, the last day of tabernacles, which identifies uh, uh, being raised up at the last day and resurrected at the last day and so forth. And, and then he would complete that work that he had began within everyone living today and complete the work of all those elect who are in their soul existence in heaven, still waiting also for the completion of the salvation of, of, by receiving their new resurrected bodies. But thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing that verse. And let's go to the next caller tonight. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yes. Hi. Good night. Um, uh, can you take a look at Jeremiah 13? Verses 15 and 16, please. Jeremiah 13, verse 15 and 16 say, Hear ye and give ear. Be not proud, for Jehovah has spoken. Give glory to Jehovah your God before he cause darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. And while ye look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. Uh, would, uh, would you agree that's actually talking to uh, reference in a time when the door will be shut and um you know and of course as you know the world continues to go on and see the scripture they are unsafe it's it's it is um turning the light into a shadow of da- darkness as the word of god brings judgment on the unsafe well yes it it um of course jeremiah is primarily um, uh, a revelation of God concerning the judgment on the church. And God did darken the sun and darken the moon and darken the stars within the churches and congregations. Revelation 8 tells us that the third part of the sun was darkened. Uh, I think it says that. Let me be sure. In Revelation 8, it says in... um, verse 12 and the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars so as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise so so god uh, did the same thing to the church that he's now doing to the world the the only difference is that it was limited to within the confines of the corporate body so the churches and congregations 
which numbered about two billion, were the the targets. They were the objects of the wrath of God. God darkened the gospel. That's the sun, moon, and stars. A third part of it is a removal of the gospel within the church. And that's why we know, as since it's the same cup of wrath and the same language in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation, or immediately after the judgment on the church, the sun is darkened, the moon does not give its light, and the stars fall from heaven. The very same celestial figures are used to represent God's judgment on the world, and again, it was spiritual. It was a removal of the light of the gospel. So the real question when seeing a verse like this in in Jeremiah um, at this point in the book of Jeremiah is is God talking about his judgment on the church when he he brought that into darkness or is it a reference to the judgment on the world that's possible and 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 so we would just have to be careful with that um, now I uh, I it I tend to think it's referring to the judgment on the world because verse 16 says, Give glory to Jehovah your God before he caused darkness and before your feet stumble. And 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 so um, he's already, the Lord has already gone into much detail in Jeremiah concerning the judgment on Judah historically, which typified the judgment on the church. And now there's a reference to a future judgment that uh, you need to hear, give ear, and not be proud, or or you will also experience this future judgment, and that could be a reference to, uh, as though God's speaking to the church and in, in the midst of the judgment on the church and saying, yet still, there is still a day when there will be this darkness, and, and that would point to judgment day. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, can you just take one more, uh, Jeremiah 9, uh, 25 and 26? Because um, that's what I'm, I'm using that tie in with what we just read in uh, Jeremiah 13. All right, let's look at this. In Jeremiah 9, 25, Behold, the days come, saith Jehovah, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised, Egypt and Judah, and Edom, and the children of Ammon, and Moab, and all that are in the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. Well, th- this is pointing again to God's judgment. Um, and when he says he will punish uh, all uh, which are circumcised with the uncircumcised, that would seem to relate to the final judgment because the judgment on the church, we, we could say, was a judgment on the circumcised in the figure God uses of Israel. As Israel were to be uh, circumcised, uh, it was a sign he gave them, and Israel in turn identifies with the New Testament church. So they are typified by the circumcised, circumcised, then the uncircumcised would be the Gentiles or the nations. And, and we know in Jeremiah 25, God speaks of judging the circumcised with the uncircumcised. He says, I will begin to um, bring judgment on the city called by my name. That's the circumcised. And then he transitions to, he takes the cup of wrath from them and he gives it to the nations, the Gentiles, and they would be the uncircumcised. And and this language seems to fit with that. Yes, uh, uh, you know the the revelation studies you 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 um, you're conducting currently uh, with the uh, the woman in the in the wilderness. Uh, it, you know it's very helpful. Uh, I find it very helpful to me, and I was you know able to. Now understand a lot more other things in, in the scripture, uh, but one more point uh, in regards to one of the customers, the, the, the uh, callers, um, uh, past two callers. Uh, if you just just 
quickly take a look at Jeremiah uh, 9.23 that talks about, um, you know, giving God the glory and God describe what, um, you know, who he is <laughs> and what we should give glory. And if you could just um, yeah. read 23 and 24, and then that's sure, it. Sure, sure. This is a, a good couple of verses for us to read. In Jeremiah 9, verse 23, Thus saith Jehovah, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am Jehovah, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith Jehovah. Yes, God, um, he, he is the one that uh, deserves all glory. I, I really like the psalm, uh, Psalm 115, verse 1, that says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. And, and that's what God does. He gives himself the glory because he's the only one deserving of the glory. There is no one else deserving of glory, even if... Um, we happen to do the things that God would have us to do if we are on the right track of understanding and we share these things according to the will of God, whatever it might be, or in our life, we happen to um, to develop in in grace and knowledge of the Lord and, and uh, spiritual uh, things begin to work out within us. We Maybe we begin to finally love or, or, or have peace in our hearts or, or whatever it is, whatever spiritual thing it is. Ultimately, what can we say? Have we arrived or are, are we the one that has wrought this? Are we the one that has done this? We haven't done anything apart from God moving within us to will and do of his good pleasure, no matter what we do, that, that is in any degree faithful or in accordance with the law of God, that too is a result of God's working in us and causing it to happen. And, and uh, I, I like that verse in John, uh, John 3, where God is, uh, you know, there's some people when they they hear that uh, regarding salvation, oh, we, we have to receive it, they say. We have to receive it. Uh, yes, it's all by the grace of God, but you have to receive it. That means you have to extend your hand. You have to do something is really what they're trying to say. And in John 3, verse 27, God even takes that, um, little stick away from people. And he says there, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. So even the things we receive, and and then it's ours because it's been a, given to us by a gift of God. It's still uh, a gift also. It's all part of the package, the whole spiritual package that God has gifted to his people. We truly are deserving of nothing, and we have earned nothing. Uh, we, we have nothing to glory in of ourself. Uh, we, we ought not to be the least proud in any matter, not of things we understand or or of any spiritual thing that's beginning to develop in our life of nothing. It's all traced back to God. So that's why God gets all the glory for everything, because he's the only one that deserves it. And that's a good place for us to be. Then we can, you know, if we're looking to God and we're saying, um, praise God and we're lifting up his name and we're speaking of his greatness and we're seeking to glorify him, then we can glory all we want. We can glory 
uh, as much as possible because that's proper and correct glory. But the, the moment it turns to ourself or, or to any man, then it's improper and incorrect. But thank you for those verses. And I'm sorry, we have come to the end of our time tonight. I would like to thank everyone for sharing your questions and your comments, and especially the Bible verses that we had an opportunity to read and consider. Uh, please join us this coming Sunday afternoon for our online fellowship, and during that time we'll have another live question and answer program. But for now I'll say good night, and may the Lord's perfect will be done. And thanks for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these Questions and Answers sessions Sunday afternoon following Sunday studies and Monday and Friday evenings following the Monday and Friday evening studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.